Accidental time. morning to all. Welcome on this beautiful Lord's Day. We're glad that you've joined us for worship. We're about ready to begin. If you uh, did not pick up a, a uh, sermon sheet with notes on that, you can pick that up as you come in. The words will be on the screen this morning. We're so glad you've joined us for this Lord's Day. And for all of those joining us live streaming, we're so glad that you've joined us from many different places. We pray that this day will be a day of encouragement and strengthening in your faith for all of you. We have a theme verse that we read every week for this year. It's from the book of Zephaniah in the Old Testament. The prophet Zephaniah wrote in the third chapter as he was encouraging the people of Israel during a very difficult time. Here's what he writes in chapter 3, verse 17. The Lord your God is with you. He is mighty to save. He will take great delight in you. He will quiet you with his love. He will rejoice over you with singing. And that's what our God does for us. And we're here today to honor and glorify his name. And we're glad that you've joined us. We're going to be led in singing this morning by Chuck and Catherine Thode. And they're going to be accompanied by Devin and Drake Bolt. So we're in for a treat this morning. Let's join our hearts in prayer as we come before God. Lord, you have been so good to us. How can we recount the many ways, even this week, Lord, that your hand of grace and blessing has been upon our lives. And we pray that this morning we might forget about the other things that are going on and we might focus on you, Lord. We might worship you in spirit and truth, that the name of Jesus will be exalted and that you will be glorified in everything we say and do. So, Lord, bless us and we now give you our gift of worship in Jesus' name. Amen. Good morning, everybody. We're here to praise the Lord this morning, aren't we? Let's stand and let's do that. These are the days of Elijah, declaring the word of the Lord. These are the days of your servant Moses, righteousness being restored. The days of great trials, of famine and darkness and sore. Still we are in the desert crying. Prepare ye the way of the Lord. Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation. 
salvation come. These are the days of Elijah. The dry bones becoming as flesh. These are the days of your servant David building a temple of praise. These are the days of the harvest. The fields are as white as the home. Declaring the word of the Lord, behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun, at the trumpet call, lift your voice, it's a year of jubilee, out of Zion's hill, salvation come. There's no God like Jehovah, there's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. Year of Jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. One more time. Behold, he comes, riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. Out of Zion's hill, salvation comes. Praise the Lord. Are you ready to go? Boy, that saxophone really adds, doesn't it? <laughs> we appreciate you being so here. So you got to sing loud. <laughs> some of you appreciate it. We have some golden oldies in the lineup this morning. But this is a good one, too. Oh, the light of your love is shining in the midst of the darkness shining. The light of the world shine upon us, set us free. Father, you now bring us, shine on me. Shine on me. Shine, Jesus, shine. Fill this land with the Father's glory. Blaze, Spirit, blaze. Set our hearts. On fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy. Send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Lord, I come to your awesome presence from the shadows into your rain. By the blood I may enter your brightness, search me, try me, consume all my darkness, shine on me, shine on me, shine, Jesus, shine, fill this land with the Father's glory, place, spirit, place. Set our hearts on fire, flow, river, flow, flood the nations with grace and mercy, send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. As we gaze on your kingly brightness, so Father's glory, place, spirit, place, set our hearts on fire. Flow, river, flow, flood the nations with 
grace and mercy send forth your word, Lord, and let there be light. Amen. Do we lose our saxophone at this point? <clears throat> This is the air I breathe. This is the air I breathe. Your holy presence living in me. This is my daily bread. This is my daily bread. Your very word spoken to me. And I
drawn from Emmanuel's veins. And sinners plunged beneath that flood, lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. Lose all their guilty stains. And sinners plunge beneath that flood Lose all their guilty stains. The dying thief rejoiced to see that fountain in his day. And there Before we get into the word uh, this morning, last week we began ending our service, not with a final song, but with the time of what we call share and prayer. You know, this is my last month here. I'm stepping down as pastor and we are looking for someone to come in and um, take this place. And you know, as, as much as we want to do the process of finding the right person, in the right way, we need prayer. We need God to be the one guiding us and guiding whoever comes to be here. And so we're spending the last few minutes in prayer and share. And I'm announcing it this morning, even though I did last Sunday morning, and I'm doing it specifically for those watching a live stream today. When I'm done preaching, we are gonna end our live streaming and the share and prayer time will not be on live stream. And the reason is that a lot of what we share and prayer for, uh, pray for is very personal. And we don't want uh, some of these things going out on YouTube for all the world to hear uh, because we, we want people to be free to share what's on their hearts, to pray for one another. And we just feel it's best for us to do that within the church here this morning. So for those live streaming, and I know we, we've gotten word that some of you when we cut off the live stream, we're trying to get it back on and it didn't come back on. So just a word for, for all of you. Well, this morning we're continuing our, our study through the, the Sermon on the Mount. When I ask God, Lord, what, what can I do to finish my time here at Occidental Community Church? And what better thing to do than the Sermon on the Mount, you know, the, the greatest sermon ever preached. 
And we can't do the whole sermon, but I've selected portions of the sermon this morning uh, in the last, uh, this month to, to, re, uh, to go over. And this, this morning we're looking at Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 through 18. And I have it printed out here on your scripture sheet. And for those at home, you can turn to Matthew chapter 6, verses 1 to 18. As Jesus now in Matthew chapter 5, 6, and 7 preaches the Sermon on the Mount, meaning on the mountain, mountainside overlooking the Sea of Galilee, where he had gathered his disciples and a great multitude of people as well. Sue and I have been to the Sea of Galilee, to that very mountain, and our guide did something to show us how a person could preach a sermon on the mountain to, to a huge gathering. He went to the top of the mountain, and we, when we talk about a mountain, we're talking about a few hundred feet, not thousands of feet. We're talking about what we would call hills in Sonoma County. And he, would, he went to the top of the hill. The rest of us were down below, gathered in kind of like an amphitheater. And he began to speak in a normal tone of voice like I am, and we could all hear him. So as he spoke on the top of the mountain, all of us below listened to what he had to say. And this is how Jesus is, uh, is speaking to his disciples right now. The first verse of chapter 6 begins like this, Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. Now this very first verse almost seems to contradict what he's already taught in the Sermon on the Mount. Look at the back of your sheet. I copied down Matthew 5, 14 to 16 where Jesus taught this, you are the light of the world. A city on a hill cannot be hidden. Neither do people light a lamp and put it under a basket. Instead, they put it on its stand and it gives light to everyone in the house. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good deeds and glorify your Father in heaven. So what he is saying is don't hide your good deeds. Don't hide your righteous living because when people see that they will glorify your Father in heaven. Well, now here he is saying, when you do acts of righteousness, hide them from men. How can these two correspond? Well, the key is in verse, um, verse 18, uh, verse 16 rather, of Matthew 5. In the same way, let your light shine before men that they may see your good works and glorify your Father in heaven, not you. What Jesus is teaching against here in uh, chapter 6 is doing your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them so that they will praise and glorify you rather than God. That kind of, of th these righteous acts that we do are never to be done to glorify ourselves, but to God. So the bottom line is this. Motive is everything. Why are you doing what you're doing? Why do you live for Christ? Why do you do acts of righteousness, acts that correspond with your faith? Is it so people can praise and glorify you or that they can praise and glorify the Lord God? For the Jew in, in Jesus' day, there were three acts of righteousness that every devout Jew did almsgiving, mean, meaning helping the poor and the needy, prayer, and fasting. And Jesus deals in this text with all three of those primary, fundamental, foundational, righteous acts that every Jew performed. So let me read through the text, and then we'll go back and look at a few things. Be careful not to do your acts of righteousness before men to be seen by them. If you do, you will have no reward from your Father in heaven. So when you give to the needy, do not announce it with trumpets or saxophones. <laughs> as, the, <laughs> as the hypocrites do in the synagogues and on the streets, to be honored by them, by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you give to the needy, do not let your left hand know what your right hand is doing. That's what we call grammatically a hyperbole, meaning an exaggeration. Of course, it's impossible to do something with your uh, left right hand that your left hand doesn't know. They don't act independently. They act from the same brain. But what he is saying is this. Just 
do your acts of righteousness without even considering who's watching and who's paying attention. So that, uh, so he says in verse four, so that your giving may be in secret, then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. But when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. When you pray, go into your closet, close the door and pray to your father who is unseen. Then your father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will heard, be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your father knows what you need before you ask him. This is how you should pray. Our father in heaven, hallowed be your name. Your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread. Forgive us our debts as we also have forgiven our debtors. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your heavenly Father will not forgive your sins. When you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do. For they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. But when you fast, put, on, put oil on your head and wash your face so that it will, be, it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting, but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. Today, the question is, what things should we do in secret? Three things. Secret giving, secret praying, and secret fasting. So I'm asking you as I preach and we share together today, examine your secret life. Is it what God wants it to be? First of all, secret giving. Now note verse two, when you give to the needy, not if you give to the needy. And also down in verse five, when you pray, not if you pray. And then down in verse 16, when you fast, not if you fast. The assumption by Jesus is my disciples will give to the needy, they will pray, and they will fast. This is a part of our everyday living for Christ. So it's not a matter, shall I choose to do this or not? This is what we do as a part of our DNA as Christians. Um, helping the needy was expected by God's people all through the Bible, Old and New Testament. By the way, question, do you remember Sodom and Gomorrah? Of course you do. They were destroyed by God. Do you know what the sin of Sodom and Gomorrah was that God came down and destroyed them for? We think of sexual per perverseness, sexual, sexual um, per depravity. That was a part of it, but that was not what the Bible says the real foundational sin was. Here's, I'm, I'm reading from Ezekiel chapter 16, verses 49 and 50. Here's what Ezekiel said to Sodom or he's, he's actually speaking to Israel, but he says this, Behold, this was the sin of your sister Sodom and her daughter, Gomorrah. Pride. Too much food. <laughs> Undisturbed peace and failure to help the poor and the needy. And in their arrogance, that initial pride and arrogance led them in their arrogance they committed detestable practices in my presence so when i saw it i removed them yes they were sexually depraved and god removed them but it came from first of all a prideful arrogant lifestyle in which they were proud they ate too much they were an undisturbed peace, meaning that all they cared about was their own personal peace, and they didn't care about anyone less fortunate than themselves. Another verse in the Old Testament, Proverbs 19, 17. He who is kind to the poor lends to the Lord. Did you know that every time you stopped and helped someone who was poor and needy, you were helping the Lord? What did Jesus say? As, as you do it unto the least of these, my brethren, you're doing it unto me. So don't look at a poor and needy person as someone out there that has no part 
of the kingdom. Everyone, poor and needy, or rich and, rich and w without need, is in the image of God. And when I help someone, poor and needy, I'm actually lending to God. And he will reward him for what he has done. God does not reward self-seeking generosity. Back of your, of your sheet, Charles Spurgeon, the great English Baptist preacher, said this, you cannot, be expected to pay, you cannot expect to be paid twice. If therefore you take your reward in the applause of men who give you high character for generosity, you cannot expect to have any reward from God. The motive which leads a man to give will form the true estimate of what he does. If he gives to be seen of men, then when he is seen of man, he, is, he has the reward he sought for, and he will never have another. We ought to have a single eye to God's accepting what we give, and to have little or no thought of what man may say concerning our charitable gifts. We give generously for God and to glorify God. I have a very close friend who I've known all my ministry. He was in the ministry before I was. We went to Bible college together. We went to seminary together. We have preached in each other's churches many, many times throughout the years. I respect him highly. I love him, and he loves me. And we've had many times where we've sat, we've discussed things theologically. We've agreed on some, and we've not agreed on others. But there was one area where we didn't see eye to eye, and that was the area of giving. Now, not to the needy, but giving in church, to the offering. When I would preach in his church, here's how they did the offering. When it was time for the offering, the deacons would come and stand before the congregation and they would be holding in their hands a, a, uh, a replica of the church in which they worshiped. And that was the offering plate, tray, the church. And then that would be announced, all those who are tithers, please come forward and leave your tithe. Tithers, for those who don't know, you give 10% or more of your gross income to God. So all the tithers would march forward and give. When they were done, then the deacons and their church offering plates would leave, and they would put out other trays on the table. Now for the rest of you who are just giving an offering, please come and leave your offering. And I questioned him about this. I said, why do you do it this way? Because I felt like I, I was uncomfortable with that, singling out tithers and, and then allowing others to come afterwards. He said, oh, we found this, that when people know others are watching, they give a lot more. And he's probably right. Probably if we passed a plate here, we'd get more offerings than if we don't. We didn't. But I thought to myself, is this not what Jesus was teaching against? Giving because someone's watching. If I don't give, I'll look like a cheapskate. And if I'm not a tither, then I'll look like I'm not really serious about following the Lord. So that was one area we disagreed. We love each other. We still, I, I honor him as a man of God, vice versa. But it was an area where um, we just didn't see quite eye to eye. Now, to give an example of the other, about five years ago, I was at a breakfast at the Salvation Army um, Center down off of Stony Point Road. Wendell and Nancy were there as well. It was right after the fires here, and the Salvation Army had gone the second, third, and fourth, and fifth mile to help the needy. Spent thousands of hours and money and food and donations to help those that were burned out. John Moore was the uh, chairman of the board at the time of, of the Salvation Army. He got up and as he was uh, about after the breakfast, and he said this, in the coverage of the citywide relief effort following the wildfires, we here at Salvation Army received little, if any, publicity in the press Democrat. And that's true. Oh, they talked about other organizations and other agencies and other help, you know, benevolent agencies, but very little about the Salvation Army. And he said this, but that's okay, because that's not why we do what we do. And I sat there and I said, amen, John, thank you. This is what Jesus is all about. 
helping the needy and not taking credit, not for fanfare, not for publicity, not for applause, but just doing it because Jesus said to do it and the glory goes to God. Isn't that what we should be doing? When we give to the needy, whether we give in church, whether we give uh, during the week, make sure that it's done in the spirit of Christ to glorify God. Well, the second secret life that God rewards besides secret giving is secret prayer. Look at verse 5. But when you pray, do not be like the hypocrites, for they love to pray standing in the synagogues and on the street corners to be seen by men. I tell you the truth, they have received their reward in full. Now, praying in public is not forbidden by God. I mean, we're going to do that in a few minutes. Praying in groups is not forbidden by God. We're going to do that in our sharing prayer time, and we do that at other times too. But um, prayer that Jesus speaks about here is, uh, is secret prayer. We'll get to that in a minute. But I, let, me, let me share with you uh, in re- relation to what this, uh, about praying to be seen by men or, or being foc- eyes being focused on the one praying rather than even the content of the prayer. When I grew up, we had a wonderful elder, a man of God, uh, who led our church. And as a child, I remember hearing him pray. He prayed the most beautiful prayers. He was from Australia. So he had that charming Australian accent, uh, for those who like the Australian accent. I, I liked it, it was very charming. He had a deep, resonant voice, almost sounded like coming out of heaven itself. He prayed in the King James English, thee and thou and thine, as he prayed. And he prayed long and beautiful prayers. He had a vocabulary in which he could stretch, he could produce sentences that uh, were just magnificent. And so often I heard people say, I just love hearing him pray. I just love hearing him pray. I don't question any motives that this man had in in praying. I believe he was sincere. I believe he was praying from his heart. I believe he was doing it on the Lord. But you know, even when you're sincere, isn't it easy to get your focus off of God onto a person? And I like to hear the way he prays. It's not about who's praying and whether it's flowery and beautiful and nice to hear. It's is that that prayer really meant to be for God? Look at the back of your scripture sheet again. R.A. Torrey, a great... Christian evangelist, the founder of Biola University, wrote this, we should never utter one syllable of prayer either in public or in private until we are definitely conscious that we have come into the presence of God and are actually praying to Him. I can remember when the thought or that thought transformed my prayer life. I was taught to pray so early in life that I have not the slightest recollection of who taught me to pray. Nevertheless, prayer was largely a matter of form Am I saying the right words? Am I doing it in the right order? Am I addressing God the way I should? Am I ending my prayer the way I should? The right form. There was little real thought of God and no real approach to God. But the day came when I realized that prayer was having an audience with God, actually coming into the presence of God. And the realization and the realization of that fact transformed my prayer life. Praying in public is okay. Praying in groups is okay. But the, real, the prayer that will transform your life, the prayer that will radically change your life is what Jesus describes right here. Verse 6, when you pray, go into your closet, close the door, and pray to your Father who is unseen. Then your Father, who sees what is done in secret, will reward you. Now for some of you, you couldn't fit into your closet and for prayer. Simply, of course, that's simply a metaphor saying go somewhere private where there's no other noise to distract you, where there's nothing around you that would visually distract you, that there's nobody present that will hear what you're saying and you have to say it in the right way, and you can pour your heart out to God. Find a closet in your life I'm encouraging you, find somewhere where you can go and you know that I'm here alone with God and I can pour out my heart to God. That 
prayer will transform your life. You know, I can't even remember in the four Gospels, unless I'm wrong, Jesus ever one time ever called his disciples and said, we need to have a prayer meeting. Anybody remember him ever doing that? He did pray in the Garden of Gethsemane before his crucifixion, but what did he do when he went to the Garden? He went alone and prayed. And the disciples were over here by themselves, and they were alone and prayed. And he taught them whenever he got together with them. When he prayed, he didn't, it wasn't collective praying, it was each person praying alone to God. And again, he didn't forbid praying in public or praying in a gathering. But the essence of prayer that Jesus teaches is closet praying to God your Father. Now, on the back, Jean-Jacques Rousseau, a French philosopher, but also a Christian. Oh, he criticized the church heavily in France, but he loved the Bible. And he loved getting alone with God in prayer. Here's what Rousseau said. Praying is like writing a love letter to your wife. To write a good love letter, you will begin without knowing what you're going to say and end without knowing what you've said. <laughs> you see what he's saying? You don't go into prayer and say, okay, I've got my prayer all written out. I know what I'm going to say. When you are in prayer with your Lord, you just pour your heart out. It doesn't have to be in flowery words. It doesn't have to be in, in fact, the Bible says there are sometimes we pray and the Holy Spirit has to take over because we can't even utter the things in prayer that are in our hearts. That's real prayer. That's transforming prayer. And Jesus said, do that. Go to your closet and pray. Don't go out so that others could see what you're praying about. Then he says in verses uh, 7 and 8, that long, repetitious prayers don't impress God. Here's what he says. And when you pray, do not keep on babbling like the pagans, for they think that they will be heard because of their many words. Do not be like them, for your Father knows what you need before you ask him. You're not going to surprise God with anything you say. You're not, you're not, he's not going to hear for the first time anything that's on your lips. He's already known in your heart what you said before you said it. So just go and as an act of submission and contrition, pour out your heart to God. You remember the story in uh, the parable in Luke chapter 18 of the two men that went up to the temple to pray, the Pharisee and the tax collector. And the Pharisee stood up to pray and he prayed thus to himself, oh Lord, why aren't more people like me and I'm so righteous and I, all the things that he did, a, a long prayer focusing on his own personal righteousness. And then the publican, the, 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 the tax collector, prayed a prayer that contained seven words. God, be merciful to me, a sinner. And what did Jesus, which one of those two men went down justified that day? The tax collector, not the righteous, self-righteous Pharisee. And so Jesus is saying, don't be like the pagans. Don't be like those who simply pray over and over again to be heard by God. And then, verses 9 to 13, here is the model prayer. It takes 30 seconds to read. This is how you should pray. Our Father in heaven, hallowed be your name. First of all, give glory to God. Hallowed be your name. Secondly, your kingdom come, your will be done on earth as it is in heaven, submitting to his will. I want your will to be done on earth just as it is in heaven. Thirdly, give us this day our daily bread, trusting his daily provision for your life. Fourthly, verse 12, forgive us our debts, as we also have forgiven our debtors, asking for forgiveness and also granting forgiveness to others who have sinned against you. And then fifthly, and lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For yours is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever. Amen. Living a life of righteousness. Lord, deliver me from evil and live, that I might live a righteous life. That's the model for uh, prayer. And you know, you can repeat it and it's worth repeating. I've repeated the Lord's Prayer more times than I can count. But it's a model prayer. It's not meant to be just uh, uh, repeated word by word. It's, it's a model for us to follow, a good model uh, for us to follow as we pray. And then verse 14 and 15. Don't forget this part. 
it's not part of the prayer, but it's what Jesus, his commentary on that prayer, a sober commentary. For if you forgive men when they sin against you, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive men their sins, your Father will, for, will not forgive your sins. Oh, he, Jesus couldn't have meant that, really, literally, did he? Yes. If I'm not a forgiving person, I don't receive forgiveness from God. That's a huge commitment to make. Forgi forgive us our debts as we forgive our debtors. We're saying to God, Lord, I'm only expecting you to forgive me to the same extent that I'm willing to forgive others when they sin against me. You make that commitment to God, you better be a forgiving person. <laughs> Finally, well, final thoughts on prayer before I get to the third point. Look at the back. Philippians 4, verses 6 to 7. I think this is probably one of the fundamental foundational passages on prayer. Verse 6 of Philippians chapter 4. Do not be anxious about anything, but in everything, by prayer and petition with thanksgiving, present your request to God. And the peace of God, which surpasses all understanding, will guard your hearts and your minds in Christ Jesus. What a great promise. And then finally, on prayer, Dwight L. Moody said this, the Christian on his knees sees more of God's will than the philosopher on his tiptoes. <laughs> I like that. We can think and reason and logically figure things out, but getting on your knees before God, humbling yourself before him and pouring out your heart, you will find more of God's will in that way than in reading every book that's ever been written on right and wrong, good and evil. Finally, the third secret life that God rewards is secret fasting. Verses 16 to 18. When you fast, again, again, not if you fast, when you fast, do not look somber as the hypocrites do, for they disfigure their faces to show men they are fasting. They don't want anybody to know that they're not fasting because I'm devoted to God and I'm going without food. Don't I look like it? That's what they were saying. I tell you the truth, they've received their reward in full, the, the praise of men, the applause of men. But when you fast, put, on, put oil on your head and wash your face. In other words, when you fast, if you're fasting, when you get dressed in the morning, look like you do every day. Don't look any different than you do every other day. Comb your hair, shave, put oil on your, whatever you do, don't look any different. So that it will not be obvious to others that you are fasting but only to your Father who is unseen. And your Father who sees what is done in secret will reward you. There are many biblical purposes for fasting. Mourning over misfortune and disaster and difficulty that's befallen you. Repentance of personal sin brought fasting. Waiting on God to answer a prayer brought people to fasting. Today, most fasting is done for losing weight, medical purposes, if you're, if you're with a group that's, that's protesting something, you go on a hunger strike. But that's not the biblical form of fasting. Biblical fasting is to devote more time to God in prayer. It is, to, it is to devote conquering sin in your life and devoting that time when you would be eating to praying about that. Or fasting on behalf of another person you've been praying for, that God would hear your prayers for them. And like this, like giving and like praying, it's not to be done to be seen by men. We had a wonderful elder in our church in Sebastopol when I was preaching there. He made a commitment to God. He, he loved sports, but he made a commitment to God. He would never watch sports on TV on Sunday. Because that's God's day. And for him to do it would be a sin. And it would have been. Because that's, the, that's what God put in his heart. But you know, he never, never let anybody know about it. I just found out by accident when he was invited to a Super Bowl on a Sunday and he wouldn't come because he, he said, well, pastor, let me tell you, but I don't normally tell people this. That's the day I don't watch sports. I do it for God. I said, God bless you, Peter. God bless you for that. But he kept it private. He didn't do it. To, no one knew about it, but I did because... I, w I went to that Super Bowl party on Sunday. <laughs> I did. I did so. To, to that level, 
of devotion. I did not have what Peter had, but he did. But that's okay because, you see, that's his commitment to God. And uh, so it, it was a matter of he was fasting. The fasting doesn't have to be food. He was fasting from watching sports on the Lord's Day. On the back, a couple more things and then we'll be done. A reminder in 1 Corinthians chapter 8, verses 8 to 9. This is good for us to remember. But food does not bring us near to God. We are no worse if we do not eat and no better if we do. Don't make food an issue of fellowship or an issue of spirituality or judging another person because they don't eat like you do or, do, or don't fast like you do. That has nothing to do with your relationship with God. Be careful, however, that the exercise of your freedom does not become a stumbling block to the weak. So fast as God puts it on your heart, for whether it's from food or anything else, but do it unto the Lord and don't do it to be seen by others. And then J.C. Ryle, the great English Anglican bishop, wrote this. Fasting is a subject about which we find no direct command in the New Testament. In this absence of direct command, we may see great wisdom. It is a matter in which each person must be persuaded in his own mind and not rashly condemn others who do not agree. One thing only must never be forgotten. Those who fast should do it quietly, secretly, and without ostentation. Let them not show others they are fasting. Let them not fast to man, but only to God. And then wrapping this all up, our secret lives the life of giving to the needy and the poor, um, praying and fasting. Colossians 3.17, I think, is a good place to end this morning. So whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through him. So I asked the question as I began the sermon, I'll end it with that. How is your secret life? How are you doing in this Next week, we'll take the rest of chapter 16, uh, chapter 6 in Matthew in the Sermon on the Mount. But I uh, go home and consider what we've read this morning and let God move in your heart. So let me close with a word of prayer and then we'll begin our time of uh, sharing prayer. Lord, we thank you this morning for the words of Jesus Christ. We pray that we might take them seriously, heed them, practice them. And as we do so, Father, not that others might see our righteousness and our devotion and our devout life, but that they might see what we're doing and glorify God in heaven. We want always to be pointing to you, Lord, not to ourselves. Forgive us when we do things for our own glory. And help us, Lord, that you're, you alone will receive glory in all that we do and say. In Jesus' name, amen. Please remain seated. God bless you who are live streaming. We'll see you next week, and we'll have one of the elders come and lead us in a few minutes.